progress. Well, good evening and uh, welcome to the Friday night study. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the Sabbath that will be coming. And we're thankful for your presence in our, our lives. We're thankful for the ways that you answer our prayers and that you continue to teach and rebuke us and correct us and set our feet once again upon the path of truth. We ask, Lord, that as we study here this evening, that you can give us an understanding, some insights into these things that we have been studying, that we can see them clearly and that we can share them with others. Help us to reflect your character in all things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I just had to shut the window there. Now, when we're looking at, we're going to be looking at a few things because I want to address um, how God has led this movement and, and, and relate this to what we've been talking about with 2030. So it's hopefully I can organize my thoughts well enough. I've had a pretty busy week, pretty crazy day. Um, and God has been working in a mighty way, so I'm very thankful for that. Now, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, Iran, what's significant about this verse? Uh, there's some gematria, like uh, it adds up to 411, and the reverse is 777. Okay, so... Iran has on his palmoni.org website um, a Bible indexer. And if you go to this verse and you look at, um, he can do this gematria on these verses. That is, it just adds up in English, not in Hebrew, um, uh, the letters that we have in the King James Bible. And the reverse sum, that is, if we take a gematria where Z is 1 and A is 26, and you add the letters in that first verse, you get 777. But the regular gematria, forward gematria, where A is 1 and Z is 26, you get 411. Um, well, actually, it's, isn't it the combined gematria that's um, 777, or is it? I always yeah. read your start. No, it's just the, it's the reverse is 777. Okay, yeah. Oh, and then the combined is 1188 and the differential is 366. Okay. Yeah. So he has these different ways of looking at these numbers. Now, I, I had watched a video where this guy was talking about numerology and how, you know, the universe is all connected by numbers and that's why we see all these coincidences and so forth. And so I was thinking a bit about this uh, because one is we get accused of using numerology and I understand what numerology is and I'm quite clear that we're not using numerology in that sort of mystical sense we're recognizing simply that God has a universe that's mathematical but also he has given us prophetic symbols in his word um, that show up again and again so the fact that we can see the number 777 in the King James Bible in the first verse of the Bible um, would be significant. We wouldn't think it's just, um, you know, coincidence. Now, we also have um, in your gematria of that first verse, it's going to give... Um, how many verses are in the Bible, so how far that verse is from the last verse of the Bible, and how many books. So there is a um, Bible chapters, um, and there's one that has 1533. So that's the reverse. What is that number? I, I could probably put this on the yeah. screen. The total number of verses in Genesis is 1533. 
Okay, so 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 this is about the book itself. Right. So the book itself has 1,533 verses. Right? That's what you're saying? Here? That's the count? Uh, yes. And 1,533 is significant for what reason? Um, symbolically, we said it's a glorious manifestation of divine the power of God. So it's the number of days from August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844, right? And it's also the year in which the Exodus occurred. Now, we also have how many chapters are in the five books of Moses? 187. Yeah, so we have 187. Now, this number, of course, comes from the first day of the first month. Uh, to the 10th day of the fifth month, which is uh, 187 days, if you count all of those days. It's also the number of days from the spring equinox to the autumnal equinox, leaving 178 from the autumnal equinox to the spring equinox. Um, so, what do we say about this? Why, why are we using these numbers in this way? What's our reason that this movement has chosen to accept that we can look at these, um, these numbers, counting letters in the King James Bible, and looking at the gematria? So, now we know that we talk about Palmoni. So this is um, Daniel 8.13. Now what's the significance of, of this verse? I, then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint that sp which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. So, of course, sacrifice is an added word. Um, so we know that this certain saint in Hebrew is Palmoni. But what's the significance of this verse? Is this just random that it happened to be in Daniel chapter 8, verse 13? No. Okay. So what is it about Daniel 8.13 as a verse, number? Well, we've considered it as part of the Fibonacci sequence. Because 8.13 is in the Fibonacci sequence. Yeah, and it's more than just a part of the Fibonacci sequence. It's an octave, right? In, in a diatonic scale, an octave is eight notes. That is seven notes plus one, the first note repeated, correct? And then it's also a chromatic scale. There are 12 tones, so it's an octave, so to speak, in a chromatic scale. So it, it ties these two musical uh, concepts together, 813. Now, also, the question that's being asked, how is this significant as far as understanding Palmoni? Why would this be here and not some other verse? So we're Seventh-day Adventists. And what, what verse is the foundation to this to Seventh-day Adventism? What is the most important verse of the Bible? The answer to the question. Right. So it's the answer to this question. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So we can see that when he's talking and he's asking this question, how long? So another saint said unto that certain saint, unto Palmoni, 
how long shall be the vision. He's going to give a number. And this number is 2,300 days or evenings and mornings. Now, what's the significance of 2,300? Oops, I don't want to go there. So I'm going to go back to the Bible verse here. So what's the significance of 2,300 days? Anybody know? Is it just some random number that was chosen? Where did where did this number come from? Okay, Rosanna, I know you said something. It's a portion of the 20, <clears throat> 2520. I think there's Ron Knight's sound coming there. Okay, it's a portion of the 2520. Okay, right. Now, it's, it's, it's a portion that is you have 220 years, and then you have this 2300 years that are attached together. So it's a portion of something. Now, what about the 1260? Is is that related to the twenty three hundred days? Okay, so when we look at something like um, a cycle. So we know we have astronomical cycles. Is the 2300 days, does anybody know if it's connected to any sort of cycle? Adventism generally doesn't talk about this. Anybody know anything about this? What I'm talking about? <clears throat> okay, so if we have um, the cycle of 391 years, for instance. That's a cycle we're familiar with, at least we should be in this movement. What is 300 years a cycle of? 391 years, I mean. Yeah, it's relating the lunar and solar cycles. Okay, so that means you have, if you have 391 years, and you were is Islamic, um, you might recognize the cycle. That is, there is three, um, what is it now? Uh, I'm trying to think of the number. Um, so every 32 years and seven months on our calendar is 33 years and seven months on the Islamic calendar. But it's going to start and end, of course, not at the beginning of a year. Like it, you, you wouldn't come from January 1st and have the calendars line up on January 1st, right? They'll just come to the same date every 32 years and seven months on our calendar will be 33 years and seven months on the Islamic calendar because the Islamic calendar is shorter by 11 days. But in order for it to line up perfectly to the year, you need 391 years for this to occur. And 
we can also say um, that this cycle of if we have 32 years and seven months, how many months is that? Three ninety one. Okay, it's three hundred ninety one months, right? So you have thirty two years, thirty two times twelve. 384 plus 7, and you have 391 months. So the cycle of 391 months is related to the cycle of 391 years. That is, if you multiply 391 times 12, you get uh, 4,692 um, days. Or not days. You get uh, four 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 thousand six hundred ninety two months. Now these months, of course, are months on our calendar. Now if I'm using the Islamic calendar, and they go thirty three years times twelve, they also have twelve months, but their months are shorter, right? And then I add seven. So they have 43, 403 lunar months in the time that we have 391 calendar months. So that means when we experience 391 years on the Islamic calendar, it's 403 Islamic years. And it lines up perfectly, right, with our, within a few hours, right? <clears throat> so if we have 403 um, years in Islamic calendar, we multiply it by 12 months, we get 48,036 lunar months in the time that we have 46,092 solar months. Now we know how long a lunar month is. Um, it's 29.530587. And we get this number. Now, this number is 142,809.918732. So, this is the number of days in the second woe. That period of 391 years is this many days. And actually, it's um, there's more to it, and I'm not going to go into that. But the thing is, this is a cycle that exists in nature, but it's represented in the Bible by a day and a month and a year in prophetic time. So why is this? What what it, What is it that we're learning when we look at something like this? What are we seeing when we look at something like a prophecy in the Bible and we find that something that appears random, a, a period of time, an hour, a, a day, a month, and a year happens to be in prophetic time, a, a natural cycle in which the Islamic calendar and our cal calendar lines up, that is the solar calendar. And it's also called a, a lunar cycle in that after 391 years, if you counted the cycle of um, lunar eclipses, they would actually repeat again every 391 years. You could, you could just use that cycle and say, this first 391 years, I'm just going to repeat it again. So, so what is God showing us by this? When we discover something like that, that a cycle like 391 or like the 2300 days, uh, has significance.
I suppose you could say those are his wheels, right? He's working beneath the wheels. His hand is upon these, these marvels. <laughs> okay, so so God is in control of things. Even though we look at the, as Ellen White talks about, the play and counterplay of human events, you know, the setting up kings and taking down kings, all these different things that occur, well, we can see that they actually are not occurring randomly that there's some kind of order that god has seen or foreseen uh, in a sense predetermined while he still gives us a free will which for some people is is a rather difficult concept to understand okay so i'm just going to read a little bit this is from a a book and it's um it's talking about Grattan Guinness. He was a uh, theologian of some sort who looked at some of these natural cycles. And so here we have this. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger. So this he's being quoted here. Um, so Grattan, H. Grattan Guinness tells us that it was when reading this work of Professor Burke's just after the fall of the papal temporal power in 1870, that my attention was arrested by a portion of it referring to these remarkable cycles. And I was consequently led to investigate their character with considerable care, and in doing so made a number of chronological discoveries, some of which I've since published in my writings on the fulfillment of prophecy. The most remarkable of Dr. Guinness's discoveries relating to the cyclical character of the prophetic times were that 2300 years is not simply a solar lunar cycle, but a solar lunar anomalistic cycle, anomalistic. So not anomalies has to do with some kind of pattern of uh, dealing with the solar, solar lunar cycle. And that astronomy as well as scripture knows of a 70 year period supplementary to uh, 25, 20 years. In the last chapter of Daniel, the angel intimates to the prophet in answer to his chronological inquiries that while the scattering of the power of the holy people should terminate at the end of the second half of the 25, 20 years, yet there should be additions of 30 and 45 years before the era of full blessedness would arrive. Of course, he doesn't quite understand the prophecies in the way that we do. Uh, in other words, to the long period of 25, 20 years, scripture adds a brief period of 75 years. And as we have just seen, astronomy does the same. The difference between 25, 20 true lunar and the same number of true solar years is 75 years. In other words, the 75 years added to this prophecy is exactly equal to the epact of the whole seven times. Now, so where is he putting these 75 years? So he, he's doing something different than we do because he has a different understanding of the 2520. But he's saying 2520 plus 75 years is a cycle. That is, we have two different cycles. He's going to talk about the period of 391 years as well. It's a solely lunar nautical cycle. So there's these different cycles. So I'm not going to go into the detail. So we can see that God has his hand in something. That God has, he has the whole world in his hands, including the sun and the moon and the stars. And um, we have all these different cycles, the 2300 years. This is the one I wanted to look at. It said, it occurred to the writer that instead of the method adopted by De Chizot, that this higher result could be obtained by taking the numbers 2300 and 1260 in the prophecies to re represent lunar years. And it was then discovered that in the corresponding number of solar years, there were fractional remainders, which if added together, would almost be exactly unity. So we have noticed this with some of the other uh, cycles as well. So I'm not going to go again into the details of this. So what is this telling us in this answer? Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What What is really being communicated with that question and answer?
Should we just take it as a time prophecy? Or should we see that there is some design, some purpose in that number itself? So God's not just saying it's going to be 2300 days because that's just how long it's going to be. Or that it's going to be 2300 days because there's some significance in that number. That it's part of something that we can objectively look at and measure. Well, I'd say my attention is uh, being drawn to that conclusion. Okay. So we can see God's hand in things. Now we're going to look at something this and and you know this study of course is supposed to be about 2030 and and it is only so obliquely we're not going to directly address all of this but we are going to address some of it. Now if I look at um here the numbers of the children of Israel. So these are going to be counted in numbers chapter 1 and 2. And also, and I ended up on the wrong thing here, so I need to go back. I don't know why I clicked on that. I need this. There we go. <clears throat> now, we're going to look at this here. So close this. Now, we did study about the blessings and the curses. So we know that some of the tribes are going to be on Mount Gerizim and some on Mount Ebal. And this is going to be talked about in Deuteronomy. Um, is it chapter? What chapter is it? Um, no, it's Deuteronomy. I think I could find this. I was just looking at it. I can't remember which number chapter it's in. Here, I'll just look it up here. The blessings and the curses. I think it's 32 or something like that. I'm just going to look there. No. Nope. Sorry about that. I thought I knew where it was. Oh, Deuteronomy 27. Okay. And we had talked about this before in some of our other studies. So let's let's go there. I know I'm jumping around to all these different share screens being shared, but um, here we have uh, Deuteronomy 27. And they're going to set up an altar on Mount Ebal. And he says that when you cross over Jordan, you're going to do this. You're going to. So he's telling them what they're going to do. They do this later after they cross the Jordan River um, and conquer Ai and so forth. And Moses and the priests and the Levites spake unto all Israel, saying, Take heed and hearken, O Israel, this day thou art become the people of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt therefore obey the voice of the Lord thy God and do his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. And Moses charged the people the same day, saying, These shall stand upon Mount Gerizim to bless the people when you are come over Jordan, Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Joseph and Benjamin. So what do we notice in these six names that are listed that are going to be on the Mount of Blessing? What do we notice about these six names? Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. Do we see Manasseh and Ephraim here? No, we don't. They will be on, on evil. No, they're not going to be on Ebal because they're under Joseph. So they're combined here. Oh. Right? On Ebal, you're going to have Reuben, 
Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. So the other thing that you would notice is e Levi is in this list. Now, what does this remind us of, this list here of these tribes? What should it remind us of? Because normally when you have a list of the tribes, is Levi included? No, not normally. No, because Levi is not numbered among the tribes, right? Now, in Revelation chapter 7, when you have uh, this, this scene of the 144,000, 12,000 from each of the tribes, you're going to see that Levi is included in this list. Dan is not. So Dan is going to be removed, and he's going to be replaced by Manasseh. Right? Revelation 7, verse 6. So you're not going to see Dan, but you're going to see Manasseh. And you're also going to see Joseph. Now, Joseph, of course, is, is one way to refer to Ephraim. But Joseph can refer to sometimes to both tribes. But here in this list, since there's already Manasseh, Joseph is referring to the tribe of Ephraim because his tribe was divided. So some people sort of argue, like, what, what's added here and what's taken away. You can see Dan definitely is gone. And Levi, of course, is one of the tribes, as we see in the Mount of Blessing. Um, but Joseph is also technically one of the tribes. Ephraim can be referred to as Joseph. And we see that in Ezekiel 37, for instance. That when we have um, this uh, two sticks, it says, write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Right, And they're going to write on the other stick for Judah. And for the children of Israel, his companions. So you're going to see that there's Joseph and Ephraim are the same, and you have Judah is, is the other stick. So that's the southern tribe. Joseph or Ephraim represents the northern tribe. So, and there's a purpose in what I'm doing here. So we're going to go back to Deuteronomy 27. So we have these two different groups. Now, when, if we go to, uh, how many of the Levites, what, what, okay, so in Deuteronomy chapter 4, I think it is, um, is it Deuteronomy 4? Um, just have to see. No, it's in Numbers, pardon me. Numbers chapter 4. I didn't know why I went to Deuteronomy. So Numbers chapter 4. Remember, number chapter, Numbers chapter 3 is when they're going to um, ransom the firstborn um, with, the, with the Levites, right? So the difference between the Levites. So they're going to take over that role. But in Numbers chapter 4, uh, they're going to talk about those that are going to serve in the tabernacle of the congregation. And they have to be how old? What age range are going to be serving as priests? Verse 3. So from 30 years old and upward, even unto 50 years old, right? So from 30 to 50. Um, all that enter into the host to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, they're going to give a bunch of information here, but they're going to tell us uh, how many of those people um, of these different tribes are going to be serving of the number that they had. Um, so he's going to give the number for each of these different families and so forth. But it says in verse 48, even those that were numbered of them were 8,504 score. Now, how many Levites were counted in the first, uh, in chapter three? Does anybody know the number?
if you count up the children of that are going to be uh, of from one month old and upward, so all of the children of the Levites, it's going to be 22,300. So some of you would remember that. So it's going to be 22,300. Okay, and then this gives us the number of those that are serving in the t in the sanctuary as 8,504 score, 8,580. So I, I put this in this chart here. And what we see is these are the tribes that are on Gerizim on the left, and these are the tribes that are on Ebal. Now, of course... This is going to be later because in Numbers chapter 4, there's 22,300 Levites total. But um, it's going, only going to be 38.48%, that is 8,580 of those, that are going to serve in the sanctuary. And that means there's going to be 13,720 that aren't. Now, in number six, what I did is I simply took the number of Levites that are mentioned there, and it's going to be 23,000 Levites. And I'm going to multiply it by the same ratio, assuming that it's the same ratio. And I'm going to get 88,050, and then I'm going to subtract that then from the 2,300, and I'm going to have 14,150 Levites that would be standing upon Mount Gerizim. So I put this number in here so you can see we have this number. And so I've added up the number that are going to be on Mount Gerizim. And remember, there's these are the Levites. These are um, the number that, that we have remaining. So whether this is correct or not, we don't know. But if we look at this number and the number on Ebal, notice that they're only 20 different. Right, so we see there's 20 here and 20 here. Tw 20 different, so it's 307,950 and 307,930. So the difference is 20 between these two. And it says that half are going to be upon Gerizim and half upon Ebal. Now, there's 462 different ways you could arrange this using this number. You could arrange the tribes. But the, number, the way that it's given in uh, Deuteronomy 27 is the only way that it would be most evenly distributed. So what does that tell us? What are, what are these numbers telling us? Because I could try arranging these in different ways, but I'm not going to get equal numbers unless we did what we just did. And if we also take what God has given um, for which tribes are going to be upon which mountain. So some people have tried to figure out, well, why are these different tribes? Uh, placed upon these different uh, mountains. But the simplest answer would be so that they're equal in number. Does that seem reasonable? That would be logical. Okay. Now, why would God do this? Why would he, why would he care that these two are equal? What is he doing? Because we're studying about Palmo and I here. Does God pay attention to detail? Always. Yes, always. He pays attention to detail. And we know that when he's given 2,300 days and when he's given 391 years, when he's he set up these prophecies and these patterns, that he's done this with a purpose. Now, 
uh, that's not the page I want. I want this page. Now, what I have here is a list, list of numbers. Now, these numbers are all the numbers of the tribes of Israel and the differences between those tribes, which I created by doing this. So what I did is I took the tribes. I'll go up here first. So these are the tribes in Numbers chapter 1 and 2. And the number that's given here for each of the tribes is listed. Now, um, and then I just put those same tribes across the top and with the same numbers. And then I'm just simply doing subtraction. So if I subtract the number of tribes of Reuben from the number of the tribes of Reuben, I'll get zero. Simeon from Simeon. And that's why you'll see this row that's all zero. That's just when you have Issachar on this side column lining up with Issachar on this side of the row. So this row of Issachar lines up with the column. You get zero. But that means I can subtract Reuben from Simeon and Reuben from Gad and Reuben, etc. And I will get these numbers. Now, all the numbers that are on, on this side of the zero are all the all the, the integers that are produced. I have positive and negative, but these will just be on this side. You see it's negative 12,080. Here it's positive 12,080. So I don't, these numbers in a sense don't count. I just take all the positive integers and, and I made a list, right? So I took all these numbers, all the numbers of the tribes of Israel and all of these. And as we saw, Odilia had used the tribes to represent spans of time. So the numbers of the tribes can represent days. And I did the same with the tribes from numbers 26. So I, I produced more numbers by doing that. And then I did this chart where I compared numbers one and two to numbers 26. And I did it twice just so that I would have the columns going different ways so I could easily add up the columns. But I could have ju just done this with one with one chart because you're just going to produce the same numbers but the opposite. This, this row just becomes this column here. And then what I did is I... Um, put all these numbers that were produced, I got rid of all the duplicates, and we end up starting on row three here um, with 1,700 and going up to row 41. So that means I have 38 different numbers that are produced, either the numbers of the tribes or the differences between the numbers of the tribes. And then I take those numbers and I, I just multiplied them here or divided them here by 365.24189. And that's going to give me how many years with a decimal. And then here I put it in years and days instead of just a decimal. And then uh, just a little bit of noise here. I probably can hear those sirens. And then I have here uh, the months, the lunar months, and the prophetic months. So so I have these spans of time. And this is just an interesting way for me to, to look at it and see symbolic uh, references to these numbers. Now, this column here, G and H and I and J, these are dates. So if I take, for instance, 2,770 days, and that's the difference between the tribe of Reuben um, from Numbers chapter 1 and Numbers chapter 26. It's, he was decreased by 2,770 uh, people over that period from the time they were in the wilderness between the two censuses, or sensi. And so I take this as a span of time, and this is seven years and 213 days. And so I put here from this, and, and there might be other places that I could place it, but I placed it from the date of the Mayan calendar, and I counted a span of time. That's that many, and it came to July 22nd, 2020, which is four days past July 18, 2020, and it happens to be the first day of the fifth month. So we know when we look at these symbols, July 18th is, is a symbol that is its, um, 
comes from uh, Millwright history, Samuel Snow's letters. And the first day of the fifth month is also a symbol. So whether this is significant or not, you know, a person would have to decide. I can also take 3,100 days. And if I count that from the same date, December 21st, 2012, I come to June 17th, 2021, which is the sixth day of the third month. So this may or may not be significant. But there are some that are much more significant uh, where we mark, you know, very important dates. But these are short spans of time. Um, and here's one that we got from Judges. So this one was actually an, an, came about from Judges 4, verse 6. And if we counted from November 9th, 1989, it brings us to the symbolic date of March 27th, 2017. And there's actually an important way in which this is related that we're not going to go into. But um, so we have these dates and these spans of time that are taken from uh, these tribes of Israel. And I'm going to eventually get these on into diagrams so that you can look at them a little more easily. And the total sum or the total difference between all the tribes was this number that was um, 120,220. And, you know, I found that this was the sum of all the divisors. I spelt that wrong. Is 252, 252,504. And we can see that the significance of that is that we have one-tenth of a 2520, and 504 is double of this. So, so it's a, a symbolic number that makes sense. We can also take this number of days and add it to the 22,200 plus 391. And I'm not going to go into why I would do this. And this comes to this number that relates to 391 years. And there's, so, so when we do this, we're doing all this Palmoni stuff all this numbers. Um, the question that I have, is this, is this valid? How can we show that this is a valid way of analyzing things? Because that's what we're doing is analysis. Why can I not just dismiss this? It's um, too many patterns that um, commingle. Okay, so so we already have established truths, right? Things that we know to be true. They're established from Adventism, and if I analyze something, I'm not creating something, right? When I analyze something, I'm just simply taking something that's there and I'm noticing details about it. Now, some of the things I may notice, I could say are significant, and some would be less so. Some might be just coincidences that aren't significant. So when we look at the numbers in the book of Numbers, we notice all kinds of interesting things. For instance, when you look at the numbering of the tribes of of, um, of Israel, you'll notice that the number eight or the digit eight doesn't show up anywhere. It is, I'll show you what I mean. So here I have uh, the numbers and I gotta just move it over a bit. So here we have the tribes. Here we have the numbers of these tribes in numbers one and two, and here we have the numbers of the tribes in numbers 26. Levi is not listed here, but um, we have these tribes. These are the 12 tribes that possess their territory. And we don't notice an eight as a digit. Is that significant, that there's no eight here? I mean, is that likely that you're going to have 
um, here we have, well, three digits, let's say, for each of these, because the, we'll just ignore the zeros at the end. And this is going to be 24 times 3, which is going to be 72. So you have 72 different digits, but not one of them is an 8. Does that mean anything? Does that tell us anything? I think it's not likely that we wouldn't see an eight, but yeah, it, it should tell us something directly because of the interrelation with the number eight and its symbolic representation. Right, so we know the number eight is symbolic, symbolic of the, re of, of the resurrection, but somehow the number eight doesn't show up in these 72 digits. And, and the chances of that occurring, I'm not quite sure what they are. I tried to figure it out. It's not very likely that you could have uh, 72 digits. I mean, if you just produce them randomly, uh, they're going to be not perfectly equally distributed, but they're going to be distributed to the point that you're at least going to have all of the digits represented from 0 to 9. But in this case, we don't have any 8s. And so that's not very likely. So, so there might be something there, but it does show us that there's, that these aren't random numbers, that even though uh, children and events appear to happen, children being born and events in our lives seem to be random, we know that they aren't random. That is, God has his hand in things, and he puts his fingerprint upon things, especially things that are godly. Now, I'm going to go to one of my other charts here and just, and, and I had noticed this, and I was trying to figure out the chances that this would occur randomly. So one of the things I was doing in reading up about the numbering of the children of Israel is I was looking at other people's opinions regarding these numbers. Now, modern critical scholarship doesn't believe that these represent any actual reality. These are just numbers that were put up of some fictional story that never happened. Of course, we know that's not the case. But because of that, they would then say, well, any sort of order or design that you see must be intentional. That is, whoever wrote the book uh, chose these numbers for a reason. But the question is, would they have the ability to have reasons that are connected with our message today? That is, if they chose these numbers, we would have to demonstrate that they, they understood the reasons for choosing certain numbers, even if those, those reasons didn't exist in their day or couldn't have existed in their day. Now, one such example is that we had in the book of Judges, when we were studying uh, chapter 5, that is, we were studying Judges, um, it was the song of Deborah and Barak, and it talked about Reuben, and it mentioned twice the divisions of Reuben. And we looked at that, that section in Judges chapter 5, and we thought there was a lot of mathematical references because we could divide things. Or we could, it means some kind of relationship exists between Reuben and, and these other tribes. So when we look at the numbers in Reuben, there is 46,500 in the tribe of Reuben in Numbers chapter 1. Now, in, um, in uh, Numbers 26, there's going to be 43,730, which is a difference of 2770, right? So you can see I just simply, I subtracted 
this number from this number. That's why it's in the negative. Okay, that makes sense to people. I don't know, maybe I should make this bigger so people can see this. So there you can see the number. There's Reuben, there's the number in numbers one, and this is the number in numbers 26. Now, I had noticed something that is in this, this chart, I, I added up this row. So I'm just going to make it a bit smaller so that we can see the whole thing. And that is, if I take the difference between Reuben and Simeon is 24,300. The difference between Reuben and Gad is 6,000. Uh, the difference between Reuben and Judah is that Judah has exactly 30,000 more than Reuben being recorded. Issachar is going to be 17,800 more than Reuben. Zebulun, 14,000 more than Reuben. Manasseh, 6,200 more. Ephraim, 14,000 less. Benjamin, 900 less. Dan, 17,900 more. Asher, 6,900 more, and Naphtali, 1,100 less. And that if I took these numbers here and I added them together, I would get the number of the tribe of Reuben. Now, when I first saw that, I thought, well, that's very odd. Maybe that's just something that naturally occurs. But then I looked at it quite, you know, quite quickly. I realized that this wouldn't be something that's a result of this. That is, if Simeon had 100 less, this wouldn't be the case, right? It would not add up to this number. Now, most of these, of course, have two zeros at the end. And so I did a rough calculation of the probability that I could just put random numbers for the different tribes, you know, the first three digits of those tribes, and how, how many... Uh, how many ways could I combine the difference between Reuben and these tribes that it would add up to the number of, of the tribe of Reuben? And I had a number with 32 zeros. Now, maybe I did something wrong. Maybe I don't understand probability correctly, but I think it's at least that much, that that's the odds that it would be random. So, but let's say it, it was even, you know, 10 zeros or 20 zeros, you know. Um, what would that tell us about the number of the tribe of Reuben and all of the numbers of the tribes in Numbers 26? What would that tell us about that, that number of the tribes in Numbers 26 and the number of the tribe of Reuben in, in Numbers 1? What, what is that telling us? Are these just random occurrences? No. No. We know it can't be, right? So it's intentional. Now, a critic would say it's intentional on the part of a person who put these numbers together. But can you imagine that somebody in the past would have thought of this idea that I'm going to do this with the with Reuben. What purpose would that serve for them to do that? Why would they do that? And would they even, you know, conceive of the, you know, not just conceive of it, but create a chart like this and just have it happen to be that way? Would they need it to be that way? Would it have any meaning to them for it to be that way? And we'd have to say no, right? Correct. Yeah, it, there would be no reason they would do that. So, so that means that these numbers were ordered by some other mind. And that would have to be God. Now, when the critics, you know, try to look at these numbers, and, and even ones who sort of take this story as based on some kind of truth, they try to make them a smaller number. So they'll say something like there's 46 contingents of 500 each and 59 contingents of 300 each and 45 contingents 
of 650 each. But when they do that, the numbers lose their significance. That is, this would not occur. You wouldn't have the numbers, once I convert them into whatever system they think that we should, um, to get the correct number. It wouldn't do this. It wouldn't produce these results. We wouldn't have Reuben subtracted from the other tribes that, that those numbers added together add up to the number of Reuben. It just wouldn't occur. Now, the reason that I'm going through this, one is I had a busy week and there was lots of other things that I was going to present and I was going to present this. But we're dealing with this 2030 and we've been dealing with these spans of time. So we know, for instance, that the numbers of the tribe of Zebulun, uh, Odilio has shown that that goes from um, the organization of the Adventist Church to July 18, 2020. It's 57,400 days from the last day of that camp meeting in 1863 to July 18th. And we know that this can't be random. And we can also connect other spans of time to July 18th and also to September 11th and to November 11th, 2000, um, or, or 1989 and also to 2019. But we also have shown that we can connect these numbers to uh, 2030. So we have several different numbers and all kinds of ways in which we've looked at 2030. Now, and, and I'm just going to go here. So I'm going to go to Adelio's study again, this tokens and harbingers and signs, right? Dealing with these events, which are these tokens, talking about the coming judgment, and that we could take this span of these times and connect them in different symbolic ways with the symbols of July 18th to July 18th, 2020 but specifically from July 18th, 2020, back to the creation of the Adventist Church, we also have this number of Zebulun. And of course, Zebulun and Naphtali um, are in Judges chapter um, four and five, dealing with these tribes that are going to be supporting um, a Barak and Deborah, and so I put the tribe of Naphtali going back to November 13th to the falling of the stars and bringing us to 1980. And that's a symbol of 1,780 prophetic months. And this is going to connect with some of this history, these signs here. Now, some people may think, well, it's not as close a hit as we need. But these numbers are rounded off. And sometimes we'll see that they, they are exact. But sometimes they just bring us within a year or a month of an event. Now, we also took the numbers of the tribe of Reuben, right? So we took the last day of the General Conference in 1888, so November 4th, and we counted the number of the tribe of Reuben in Numbers chapter 1, and it comes to Parminder's ordination. We can see that Reuben, representing a man, is connected with Parminder. And then... We're going to have 1,279 days to August 29th, 2019, which is Parminder's Rebellion. And then we're going to take one hundredth of that number. And I haven't really spent much time looking at these smaller numbers, but I already have the 46,500 going to Parminder's ordination. And then we have his separation from the movement, which is August 29th, 2019. And it's going to be 465 days to December 6, 2020. So we have a structure here that shows this significance. Now, we also, of course, can connect these to 2030, right? So I'm going to just go here. So this is the 232 years, 1798 to 2030. I have the number of days here. It's... Uh, 28,071 months, 
And so these num this number here, 2871, is a significant number, right? Yes. Right. It's It's got all of the numbers of July 18, 2020 in it, just not in the order we normally would have them, but it's still there. And then we can also take from Miller's, uh, uh, which is the Battle of, of Plattsburgh or Lake Champlain, depending on your perspective, September 11th, 1814. And we can take the numbers of Judah, 76,500. It brings us to February 22nd, 2024. I'm not going to go into all the things about this here because we've gone through this before. And the numbers of Judah from Numbers Chapter 1 bringing us to December 10th, 2020. This is when Dwight sent a letter, he dated a letter on December 10th. This is going to be four days after December 6th. And there's all kinds of things to this structure, which I'm not going to look at right now. But the point is we have these spans, these numbers of the tribe of Judah. And we can connect these, we can connect this to this history of April uh, April 5th, 2030, and also to uh, other dates in 2030. So I can't remember where my other chart is. It's probably back here. Um, yeah, so I'm trying to find the chart that I want. This was dealing with, um, here it is. Uh, this was dealing with um, Collins' prediction, taking these spans of time, and we have um, the symbols of the 18,720 hours with 780 days, uh, 259,200 seconds, well, it's 111 weeks and that many seconds. Um, so all these different symbols of July 18th, and we go from January 11th, and we're going to have these 80 going to April 5th, 2030, with that number 2640. It's a symbol of Islam. We've got all these different symbols here. So the question is, what do we do about it? Are we predicting something in the future? Because here we have analysis. But we've already had this date, April 5th, 2030, show up in various ways. The week of Christ, um, the, the prophetic mirror structure that we get um, from uh, the 252, the divisions of the 2520 connecting us back to Abraham's history. Um, we also get it from the fact that there's 2,300 months from the first day of the first month in 1844 to the first day of the first month in 2030, 2300 months, which is also 186 solar years and also 187 prophetic years and 20 prophetic months. So we have all these different things that show us that 2030 is needs to be understood. But the question what we have when we're predicting something in the future, we know we can't know the event, can this analysis give us a date in the future that's meaningful? That's the question. Should we ignore 2030? No. no. Now, we already know that Adilio has looked at numbers in the future based upon um, these symbols. Colin has as well though he's done it a little bit different way. He didn't do as much analysis as we have here. But we would have to, and, and we also connected to this, the book of Ezra as well. So Ezra is going to give us uh, 2030, April 5th, 2030 as well. So all these different ways. But are we foolish to think that we're seeing something in these numbers? Or are we recognizing that God has these things, foreseen these things, and has directed us to these things? 
And what, what other evidences would we need that God is directing us? What, what other types of things have to occur? Because God's not just dealing with our curiosity about the future. Why is he showing us these things at this time? Could it be so that we will recognize a pattern? Okay, so he wants us to recognize something and, and a pattern, but for what purpose? For curiosity's sake? No, for preparation. Okay, so he's trying to give us information about the time that we're in right now, the crisis that exists within this movement, and about a preparation that's needed. So our messages have, have not been focused upon dates alone. Our messages, our understanding, our study has been focused upon the work that God wants to do with us. Correct? Agreed. So one of the evidences that something is true is not so much that you can find some pattern, but that it's going to work upon the people who are seeing these things in a way that's going to bring about repentance, that Christ's character is going to be reflected in them. If it's not bringing a conviction to us, if it's not changing our lives, then it really is serving no purpose. Now, people often ask me that question when they're a skeptic. Well, what's the purpose of this? What is it that, you know, why do you care about these numbers, right? They, they, they're trying to catch you in some way. But for me, all of these numbers, everything that we've learned in this movement, when we looked at the 2520 and we saw that these dates lined up with these events in the past we didn't just dismiss it as a coincidence we accepted it as true now some people of course they had a different opinion they just said well it's a coincidence it's nothing's there just you know go back to regular adventism but of course we kept studying these things and we started to find that more and more was there and that the there was that Adventism has been founded upon, has been founded upon, a solid foundation of truth. And that this foundation includes the understanding of the symbolic nature of numbers and their application in Bible prophecy. And for a Seventh-day Adventist to ignore these things merely because we don't believe in time setting is foolish. We know that we can't predict events in the future, but we need to measure the time and we need to, because God is directing us and showing us things that actually allows us to see what choices we are making that are incorrect and also what he wants to do to reform us because God is wanting to Prepare us for something. Now, those who are going to be prepared for the events in the future are not just going to be caught up in speculative theories. They're not going to just be noticing patterns in, in numbers. They have to have an experience, an experience that's going to change them, that's going to transform their characters. And we call that the everlasting gospel a three-step testing prophetic message that uh, develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. And God has to be doing that. But we also believe that, that there is this upper room experience. And, and we're going to see this in the, in the morning studies when we go into Gideon deeper. I mean, there comes a time when that refining number comes to a point because the people themselves are refined that it's not going to become smaller we're not going to continually have people leaving this movement there's a work that needs to be done upon our hearts because this movement has to come into an experience in order to be ready for whatever is ahead or whenever it's ahead of us 
2030 might there might be some significant events but we don't know what they are what we do know is that 2030 is showing us something about this movement now that's where the importance lies Any thoughts on this, what I'm talking about? I know it's, I wanted to focus on this significance just of what we saw in the numberings of the tribes of Israel. You know, and it, it's kind of interesting. Um, just when you look at that chart, um, which chart was it? Uh, I think it was the other chart. I'm just going to go back. I just want to look at these numbers. Hang on a sec. Okay. Okay, so where was it? I think it was further this way. Oh, here it is, uh, somewhere here, I think. Okay, it was up here in this thir 300, uh, 232 years. Now we have this number 2871. So how many different combinations can we have of those four digits? Wouldn't you be able to have about 16? Is it 16? I'm asking. I, I really don't know. I thought it was 10, but I, I used to know. Because I can have 2, 8, 7, 1, 2, 8, 1, 7, 2, um, 7, 1, 8, 2, 7, 8, 1. And then I can put, you know, the 8 at the beginning. So that was can't remember how many so um, I put eight at the beginning and I put seven at the beginning then I put one at the beginning so maybe 16 you could be right but anyway so that's that number there is these digits you could have 10,000 um, different numbers that have four digits right I would think so. Okay, so I I was just looking at some of these these numbers, and I had a number generator uh, produce. Uh, what it did is it ordered uh, the numbers from one to ten thousand randomly, and I have these numbers here. Now it's kind of interesting. The first number that it chose, like the way that it ordered it, it put in the one place the number 8217. So out of the numbers 1 to 10,000, 8217 is the first number that it chose. So so if there was 16 out of 10,000, uh, what would be the chances that that would have occurred randomly? Well, that would be 16 and 10,000, right? I'm looking at it weirdly, but 0 0.0016. Yeah, 0 0.0016. So it's not very likely that this random uh, calculator, random number generator, would put these numbers in that order. So I thought it was kind of interesting. You know, maybe it's a coincidence, but it's not a very likely one that it just happened to do that when I was looking at 
uh, these numbers. Now, it was also interesting, the number that we usually associate is 18720. And if you go up to, um, it's 18, 1870 on this, you can see the numbers on the side. Um, 1870, that's a symbol of July 18th. Was that the one? Or was it, no, was it... Um, what eight seven two? Yeah, it was seven hundred and eighty. Is what it was, or maybe it was seven hundred and eighty. That's the first one. Here, I'll find it here. So we do have a few different numbers that it can match with. Uh, yeah, so I want huh. one seven two. So when I look for that number here, it's going to be. Why is it not showing me the number? If you just go down. Two, three lines. You have one eight seven two and one eight seven. Yeah. So, so here we have. Uh, yeah. So this is a reverse, right? We got zero seven one eight lines up with one eight seven two. So, so this is another way we could have um, July eighteenth, but in reverse. So, I mean, I don't know what the odds that 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 happened with this number, but that it's associated with a number that's. Uh, July 18th. Now, of course, this could just be random. It's just just happened to be this way. Um, but the point is, random numbers shouldn't have any meaning or significance. And and those are just numbers generated, you know, by randomly. But we can see here that this isn't random. God choosing. Which tribes are going to be on the Gerizim and which are an evil has to do that there is only one way in which these tribes can be ordered, that they're going to be pretty much equal in number out of 462 possibilities. So we have to make a decision. Are we going to accept what God is showing us? Are we going to be converted? Or are we going to dismiss this? I mean, that's the question I ask myself. I mean, I find this very convicting. It's not something I was looking for. Just trying to confirm whether something is true or not. Just analyzing things. 2030 wasn't something I was looking for. Even July 18th wasn't something I was looking for. Simply analyzing. Okay, so... <clears throat> Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the Sabbath that's coming. We ask for your presence in our hearts, in our homes, in our minds. We pray for the time that we have to study together. We ask that you can instruct and teach us. And we pray for the needs that we have, that we can depend upon you and trust in your ways. Be with us now and in our studies in the future. And we pray this. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.